Um, good afternoon. Um, on behalf of the Political Theory Project, I'm delighted to welcome you to this afternoon's event. I'm John Tomasi, the director of the Political Theory Project. The mission of the project is to encourage conversations about the ideas and institutions that might make societies simultaneously free, prosperous, and fair. In pursuit of that mission, we're particularly interested in encouraging each of you, each student at Brown, to do his or her best to think uncomfortable thoughts. To that end, we try to bring you speakers who will encourage you to rethink, rethink, rethink some things you previously thought and maybe to think some new ones. If they make you uncomfortable along the way, um, all the better from our perspective. A crucial aspect of the project is we try to encourage students to take control, and in that spirit, we give away control to the students. So I'm delighted to give away control to uh, Anthony Stalin, Executive Director of the Janus Forum. Thank you. That always happens. You should really get a stool or something. Well, good afternoon. I'm Anthony Stalin, the Executive Director of the Janus Forum, and I'd like to welcome you all to the 14th Janus Lecture. Now, originally, we were going to entitle this lecture Drug Money, but then we sort of thought, well, we're not really sure what type of people that's going to attract. <laughs> so we went with the more conservative, doing good or doing well, ethics in the pharmaceutical industry. And we're joined today by two experts in the field, so I'll keep my introduction very short, and I'll just tell you a little bit about the Janus Forum, who we are, what we do, and how we got started. So the Janus Forum is the student arm of the Political Theory Project that Professor Tomasi just mentioned. And we seek to encourage and elevate the level of conversation, debate, and thought around political and social ideas at Brown. Now we're a fairly new organization. We got started about four years ago. And the idea for the Janus Forum was born uh, by, from a group of undergrads that were committed to the principle that Students' views should be the result of well-reasoned and well-rounded critical thinking rather than the, than the simple expressions of ideas that are fashionable. And to arrive at these strong opinions, students need to examine as many different perspectives and ideologies as possible. And so our name comes from the Roman god Janus, the god with two faces, as we believe that there are at least two sides, two perspectives to every critical issue. Now, originally, we were a small group, and we just organized the Janus Lectures. But today, we're, we've grown bigger, and we put on a broad range of events. On the one hand, we host student debates through the Janus Political Union. We also put on Janus Conversations, which are small, uh, small discussions with Brown professors with a lot of time for Q&A session. And then we also hold lunch seminars at the Faculty Club, where Brown students come and enjoy a free meal while discussing a predefined topic. But through all our events, we present students with the opportunity to explore opposing views and test different theories. Because our initiative is based on the firm belief that Brown students have character. And character doesn't simply mean having enough courage to stand up for your convictions. Having character means having so much courage that you're willing to question your beliefs as well. And so the Janus Forum provides a place, a place for people with diverse viewpoints and opposing views to come together and discuss freely and passionately. A place where students can explore all the different views that are out there and then arrive at their own opinion, not, knowing not only what they believe, but why they believe it. So today we're gathered to discuss fundamental issues in the pharmaceutical industry. Where do pharmaceutical companies' responsibilities lie? with their shareholders or with society? And do drug, co do drug companies have ethical obligations? And to answer these questions, we're joined today by two distinguished guests who will speak for about 25 minutes each. <clears throat> Dr. Marsha Angel will go first. She's a senior lecturer in the Department of Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School and the former editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine. Dr. Angel will be, fo will be followed by Dr. Mary Ruart, Dr. Ruart spent 19 years as a pharmaceutical research scientist for Upjohn Mar Pharmaceuticals, and she was a candidate for the 2008 Libertarian Party presidential nomination. After both speakers are finished, they will have the opportunity to ask each other one question, and following that, we'll open up the Q&A session to all the audience members. And after that, we invite you to join us for a small catered reception in the front lobby. 
And now you've heard more than enough from me, so please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Dr. Marcia Angel. Thanks very much, Anthony. It's uh, a, a great pleasure, uh, a privilege, uh, to have been invited to participate in the Janus Lectures, and a special pleasure for me to be in Providence. I'm a direct descendant of Thomas Angel and Roger Williams, and while that <laughs> And while that particular gene pool has no doubt been diluted greatly over 11 generations, uh, I do take a certain irrational pride in it. And in a sense, uh, I hope sometimes uh, to be continuing the family tradition of heresy. <laughs> I'm going to begin today with a little heresy. I was originally told that the title of this lecture, or this, this pair of lectures, was Corporate Social Responsibility in the Pharmaceutical Industry. That's what I was told the title was. And so that's what I had on my first slide with a question mark after it. Now, I have a problem with this title. This title assumes that investor-owned businesses do indeed have social responsibilities beyond their fiduciary responsibility to increase the value of their shareholder stock within the constraints of the law. Although it's good public relations to suggest that the drive to maximize profits is tempered by other responsibilities, I believe there's little evidence of that in any major industry, including the pharmaceutical industry. Sometimes a business may support a social cause from its marketing budget, but the aim is almost always to increase sales. Even if you look at these little programs that some drug companies have to give away free drugs to needy people, uh, the cost of those drugs to the companies is pennies, the marginal cost. Uh, yet they claim tax deductions based on the retail value of those drugs. So they probably come out ahead. Indeed, if businesses were to significantly curtail profits to further social aims, heads would roll in executive suites. So right off the bat, I have a problem with the title or the original title of this session. It buys into the fiction that investor-owned businesses generally struggle to balance profit maximization with social concerns. Hence the question mark. Now, I have no doubt that drug companies would prefer to bring an important drug to market rather than a trivial one, all things being equal. But suppose they're not equal. Suppose the trivial drug is more profitable, as it usually is, for reasons that I'll discuss later. Pharmaceutical companies are simply not set up to leave money on the table, and they don't. Moreover, the pharmaceutical industry, like other highly profitable investor-owned businesses, is in a sense a victim of its own success. Wall Street doesn't care how profitable you are today. The point is to be even more profitable in the next quarter. So if your profits are in the stratosphere today, as the drug companies are, you're compelled to outdo yourself tomorrow. That's the paradoxical bond the pharmaceutical industry finds itself in. It can allow nothing to hinder its drive for profits, or Wall Street will punish it severely. Nowadays, the pharmaceutical industry isn't even very fussy about the constraints of the law. This year, Pfizer pleaded guilty to charges of fraudulently marketing drugs and was fined $2.3 billion, which included the largest criminal fine levied against any company ever. 
Only six years ago, it paid $430 million to settle very similar charges, so evidently the company saw it as just the cost of doing business. Pfizer is not unique. Most of the big drug companies have engaged in the same illegal practices and paid fines. In addition, several top-selling drugs, such as Vioxx, were promoted widely even after they were known to be unsafe, and in some cases, the manufacturers deliberately suppressed information about the risks. All of this is a far cry from subtle considerations of social responsibilities. Except for flouting the law, the behavior of the pharmaceutical industry is simply capitalism in action, nothing special. But what distinguishes this industry from others is that the product is indeed special. Prescription drugs are not ordinary discretionary consumer goods like televisions or computers. They can be essential for people's health and even their lives. People can't simply decide to do without them or wait until they can save up enough money to buy them. Moreover, people are dependent on their doctors to decide whether they need a drug in the first place and which one they need. In short, these are not discretionary consumer products. So there are indeed strong social reasons for wishing the pharmaceutical industry would temper its profit-seeking behavior in favor of, say, producing safer and more important drugs and making them available at lower prices. But such tempering cannot possibly come from within the industry. It will have to be imposed from without. And I'll say more about that later. Now, what does the pharmaceutical industry say about itself? It presents itself very differently, almost as a charitable enterprise. It maintains that its primary purpose is to discover important, innovative drugs and bring them to market, and that it does so at considerable risk. It also maintains that prices must be high to cover their huge research and development, R&D, costs. This implies that they spend most of their sales income on R&D and afterwards have only enough left over for modest profits. Is any of that true? In my remaining time, I'll first present an overview of the industry, then follow with a few closing comments about social responsibilities. As you'll see from the overview, the reality of this industry is very different from the way it presents itself. Now, this first slide uh, shows the top 10 drug companies in the world in uh, 2008, last year. These are the 10 companies that dominate the <coughs> pharmaceutical industry. It's a global industry, uh, as I'll mention later, but they dominate uh, the industry. They account for more than 40% of worldwide sales in prescription drugs from all companies. Uh, last year, their sales were uh, of prescription drugs were $310 billion uh, out of $725 billion in the world. Now, as I said, it's a global industry, not an American industry. If you look at these top ten companies, you find that five are American, yes, but five are European. The uh, biggest company, drug company in the world, is Pfizer, which had uh, sales last year of $43 billion. Uh, there are some countries that would like to have GDPs that big. But the, the second biggest is a British company, GlaxoSmithKline. The third is a Swiss company, Novartis. The fourth is a French company, Sanofi Aventis. The fifth is another British company, AstraZeneca. Uh, the sixth is an, another Swiss company, Roche, and then there are four American companies. The drugs themselves are manufactured all over the world. Uh, Pfizer has uh, 60 manufacturing plants in 32 countries, some of them in third world countries where the labor is cheap, some of them in Ireland because you get uh, tax breaks that way. Uh, but if you, but 
the drugs uh, then have to fly over the border all the time from all over the world. And I mention that because Americans are invited to believe that if they import drugs from Canada, they will immediately turn to poison. Uh, annual reports of these 10 businesses show that they are all very similar. To be sure, some of the annual reports are in dollars, some are in Swiss francs, some are in euros. Uh, but they're similar in the sense that they all spend similar percentages of their sales income on marketing and administration, uh, similar percentages on research and development, and keep afterwards uh, similar percentages in profits. Another thing they have in common is, for most of them, the United States is their profit center. Why? Because this is the only advanced country in which the prices of brand name drugs are not regulated in some way. And so brand name drugs in this country cost roughly twice as much as they, the same drugs as they do in Canada and, uh, and Europe. Uh, essentially what these other countries say is that in exchange for the monopoly rights we give you we will, in one way or another, they have different methods, control the prices you charge for brand name drugs. They don't control the prices of generic drugs, so they cost roughly the same in uh, these other countries and in the United States. But because this is their major profit center, all of these, uh, the, these companies, the European companies as well as the American, uh, imply that they are American companies. Uh, who, know, who knew that uh, Paxil was made by a British company or uh, Nexium was made by another British company because they like to uh, imply that they are American uh, companies because it's a profit center. Uh, the Trade Association of the Pharmaceutical Industry called the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, or Pharma, uh, consists of 29 companies all over the world, so it's misleadingly named. This uh, second slide is a little bit different from the previous one. It shows the top 10 American <coughs> companies uh, last year. Uh, those were the ones listed in Fortune Magazine's uh, rankings of the uh, 500 most profitable businesses in the United States. There is another difference in this slide, too. Uh, it, it includes all sales and not just sales of prescription drugs. Now, for most companies, this doesn't matter. It's the same thing. But Johnson & Johnson, for example, makes a lot of consumer products as well as prescription drugs. And that's why it's the biggest in, in uh, the United States. The top 10 in the United States are Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, Abbott, Merck, Wyeth, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Lilly, Sharing Plow, Amgen, and Gilead Sciences. In a sense, this may be the most important slide I'm going to show you because uh, it shows the vital statistics of these top 10 American companies. And the first thing I want you to notice is the phenomenal profit margin. Uh, last year, they had sales of $269 billion. Uh, they kept, after all of their expenses, 49 billion or 18% of their revenues as profits. Now, this compares with less than 1% for all the Fortune 500 industries. 18% uh, versus less than 1%. Every year, every year, year after year, the pharmaceutical industry is either number one or two, I think it dropped to three once, uh, of the top 50 industries that the Fortune 500 uh, lists. Uh, consistent consistently makes profits three to six times uh, what the median is for the other industries. And, and last year, much more than that. I mentioned that because how can you call this a risky industry when year after year it's so fabulously profitable? Risky industries have good years and bad years. For the pharmaceutical uh, industry, every year is a good year. The next thing to notice 
is the vast amount of money they spend on marketing and administration. $83 billion last year, or almost a third of their sales income. Almost a third. Now, the companies lump together marketing and administration for, I don't know quite why they do that, but they all do it. Uh, and I suppose if you were to separate them, both of them would be so embarrassing, they sort of mush them together. But there's reason to believe that of this 83 billion, seven, and I won't go through the calculations uh, because I don't have time, but roughly 70 billion of that 83 billion went to digital marketing alone. I'm gonna come back to that later. So now what will we notice? Research and develop. These 10 companies spent $41 billion on research and development, or 15% of their revenues. Now, $41 billion is a lot of money, but it's only about half of what they spent on marketing and administration, and less even than they kept in profits. So when drug companies say that high prices are necessary to cover high R&D costs, they're really to cover their enormous marketing and administrative expenditures and to maintain their obscene profits. This may be the most important take home message I'm giving you today. So what are we getting for all of this money? What is the output of this industry? This slide shows the output of the pharmaceutical industry uh, in the eight years, 2000 through, through 2007. Uh, a little background first. Before a drug can be sold in the U.S. Um, I'm sorry, did you have a question? Or? I thought you were pointing at something. I'm sorry. Uh, background. Before a drug can be sold in this country, it has to be approved by the FDA, wherever it's made. And since all of these companies, the big companies, want to sell their drugs in the U.S. because it's more profitable, they all have to get their drugs approved by the U.S. FDA. Approval depends on the company demonstrating in clinical trials that the drug is reasonably safe and effective. But compared with what? They don't have to compare the drug with anything, usually, except a placebo a sugar pill. So the drug merely has to be better than nothing. Now, people think that FDA approval means that a drug offers something better. But in fact, it could be worse. For all we know, within any class of drugs, each successive drug is worse than the last one. The FDA, when it reviews a drug for approval, classifies it in two important ways. First of all, it classifies it according to whether it's a new drug at all, what the FDA calls a new molecular entity. Here are the new molecular entities. Or whether it's just an old drug in a different dosage form or maybe combined with another one, a new combination, some sort of rejiggering of an old drug. The second way uh, the FDA classifies drugs it reviews is whether the new drug is likely to represent an improvement over existing drugs to treat the same condition. So what is the yield? What was the yield over these eight years? Well, 667 drugs were approved, came on the market in those eight years. And about 25% were new molecular entities. The other 75% were just old drugs. And even more startling, if you look at the ones that were classified as likely to be improvements over existing treatments for the same condition, that constituted only 20% of the total. In fact, innovative drugs, these 75 that were both new molecular entities classified as likely to represent improvements accounted for only 11% of the total. The major output of the, the industry were these drugs that were not new drugs at all and that were classified as unlikely to represent improvements. That is the major output of this mighty industry. 
These are called Me Too drugs. Some of these are also Me Too drugs, but these by any definition are Me Too drugs. Uh, and, and what is a Me Too drug? Well, a Me Too drug is simply a trivial variation of a drug already on the market. There are whole families or classes of Me Too drugs. You've probably all heard of Lipitor. It's a Me Too drug, one of six very similar uh, drugs to lower cholesterol. You've also probably heard of Celexa or Lexapro, also Me Too drugs. These are uh, two of five antidepressants of the SSRI type. Since Me Too drugs are rarely compared with others in the class at equivalent doses, only with placebos, there's no way to know whether one is better or worse than another. For all we know in each of these classes, Prozac was the best, and then <coughs> Paxil was worse, and then Zoloft was worse. We don't know one way or the, uh, or the other. Probably they're all much the same at equivalent doses. Now, why are Me Too drugs the major output of the pharmaceutical industry? First, they cash in on already established lucrative markets. They tend to target vague, chronic conditions in essentially normal people, conditions like erectile dysfunction or acid reflux or shyness. Why? Because there are more normal people than sick ones. So the markets are bigger. This is Economics 101. I'm sure a lot of you would, would know that very well. Uh, moreover, these markets, these huge markets, can be readily expanded because the conditions are usually vague and often impossible to define objectively, like shyness. You may have noticed that many drug ads promote the condition more than the drug. What they're trying to do is convince people that they have something that requires long-term treatment. And it's been shown that ads for one Me Too drug increase the sales of other drugs in the same class because more people become convinced that they have the condition. You can't do that with a serious disease like cancer. You either have it or you don't have it. Me Too drugs also target conditions like high cholesterol or high blood pressure, which can have serious consequences but are not in and of themselves diseases. Drug companies expand these markets by lowering the cutoff for when treatment is required. For example, if they can convince doctors that high blood pressure is anything over a systolic pressure of 120 uh, instead of anything over 140, they've greatly expanded the market. Turning out Me Too drugs is not just a matter of wanting a share of a large, expandable market. It's also a way of getting or extending monopoly rights. When a new drug comes on the market, the government grants it exclusive marketing rights for a certain period of time. These are brand name drugs. When the monopoly expires, other companies may sell the same drug. These are called generic drugs, and they're much less expensive. So when a drug is about to lose its monopoly rights, the same company, or different companies at any time, may change the chemical composition just enough to patent it and get a new monopoly. That's relatively cheap and easy to do and very lucrative. Prozac, for example, the first of the SSRI antidepressants, was quickly followed by Paxil and Zoloft and Celexa and Lexapro, all Me Too drugs. Most advertising is for Me Too drugs, trying to persuade people that one is better than another, even though there's seldom any evidence to that effect. Where do prescription drugs come from? Well, there have been several studies looking at this question, uh, and they all converge on the same figures. Uh, several analyses have shown that the early research was done not in the companies that sell the drugs, but in NIH-funded laboratories, mainly in universities and at the NIH itself. 
About 55% of the important studies stem from NIH-funded labs, 30% from foreign labs, <clears throat> and 15% from drug company labs. Drug companies license in many of their drugs from universities are startup biotech companies, and this is especially true of the most innovative drugs. Even among Me Too drugs, the progenitor in the class is usually based, was usually based on NIH or foreign uh, research. For example, look at Lipitor, which for years has been the biggest selling drug in, in the world. Uh, that came on the market, uh, or it, the progenitor, I'm sorry, not Lipitor itself, the progenitor was a drug called Mevacor, uh, made by Merck, which came on the market in 1987. Mevacor was based on research done at the University of Texas and in Japan, in the government lab in Japan, uh, and then licensed to Merck, which made it and sold it. Uh, afterwards, all of the Me Too drugs were relatively easy to make by changing the molecule uh, enough to get a new patent. So Mevacor, which is now generic lovastatin, nobody buys it because it's not advertised. But it was followed by Zocor and uh, Pravacol and uh, Lipitor and Crestor and all of the others. And the same is true with Prozac and, and the SSRIs. So you might say, okay, what's wrong with that sequence of events? What's wrong with uh, public, publicly funded uh, research uh, giving rise to the creative early discoveries and then at some point handing off uh, the, the uh, fruits of the research uh, to private companies for development? Uh, certainly the drug companies uh, pay for all of the clinical trials, probably the most expensive part of the research, for sure the most expensive part. Uh, what's wrong with that? And then they manufacture the drugs and they distribute them. So that sounds like a pretty good way to do things. Well, the problem is they expect to, expect to be rewarded as though they were the source of innovation, which they're not. And therefore, they expect to be able to price their, their drugs as high as they like. And the taxpayer gets to play, pay twice, first for the NIH-funded research and then at the drugstore. Now, I'd like to go back to the roughly 70 billion the top 10 American drug companies spent on marketing last year. Where does all that money go? The industry uh, will account for only the amount it spends on three functions, really. Sales representatives, direct-to-consumer advertising, and medical journal advertising. And these activities last year for these 10 companies could have accounted for no more than $15 billion. That left $55 billion totally unaccounted for. That's the elephant in the living room. That is a lot of money to have out there unaccounted for. A lot of money to leave lying around without a word about what it's for. So let's look at what it might be for. Where did the missing $55 billion go? Well, we know where a lot of it went. Uh, and uh, as, sorry, go back here. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry for many years has had the largest lobby in Washington, D.C. It gives generously uh, to political campaigns uh, of all sorts. It supports uh, a plethora of front groups, both patient advocacy groups and policy organizations uh, that masquerade as grassroots organizations but are sponsored, created and sponsored by the pharmaceutical industry uh, called AstroTurf groups. They give generously to uh, medical schools, uh, they also give to some community and cultural organizations. And, and that's a lot of money, but it isn't $55 billion. I think much of it goes here uh, to uh, bestow their largesse on physicians. Why? Because doctors write the prescriptions. They have to win the hearts and minds of doctors. 
They write the prescriptions. They do the clinical research that's going to determine whether a drug uh, makes it to the market and how people regard the drug. They write the papers and the textbooks. Uh, they teach uh, medical students, provide continuing medical education. So the pharmaceutical industry supports most continuing medical education, most professional societies, funds or subsidizes many medical conferences, pays for a lot of the educational materials in medical schools, uh, bestows gifts, meals, and junkets on doctors. Uh, wherever two doctors are gathered together, so too is the pharmaceutical industry. Now, the companies know it's marketing. It's not education. They don't have an education budget. It comes out of their marketing budget. Uh, but the medical profession, because it's nice to do so, uh, has largely abdicated its responsibility to educate doctors about the use of prescription drugs. And it's abdicated that responsibility to companies with a clear conflict of interest. Uh, and yet it's self-evidently absurd to look to an investor-owned company for critical, unbiased information about a product it sells. And in other walks of our life, we know that. If we want to decide whether to buy a Toyota or a Honda, we don't ask the Honda dealer. We know better than that. And yet doctors somehow uh, have been so uh, carefully tended and profitably tended that they pretend to think that they're getting education from the companies who can gain from this. Also, you have to follow the money. If you're really being educated, you pay the teacher. If you want to take piano lessons, you pay your piano teacher. The piano teacher doesn't pay you. But here, it's the pharmaceutical industry paying doctors to be educated, which tells you the real nature of the transaction. They are buying access to doctors and to their loyalty. Now, many doctors say that uh, drug companies don't influence them, but there is a lot of evidence that they do. And it also leads to bias in research and education. But you're not doctors here, and so I'll stop my lecture about doctors. Uh, what I want to do now is come back to this. Whoops. Um, sorry. OK. I'm sorry, I didn't see. Uh, almost finished. Uh, now I'd like to turn to the industries, this is what I was looking for, uh, influence in Washington. The pharmaceutical industry has for years had the largest lobby in Washington, as I said, and it nearly always gets what it pays for. Right now the industry is donating generously to Senator Max Baucus, the point man in the current health reform uh, efforts, no surprise. As just one example of getting what it pays for, Look at the Medicare drug benefit. In 2003, Congress passed a Medicare prescription drug benefit, a Byzantine bill that would partially subsidize drugs for seniors. It contained an extraordinary provision. Medicare was expressly prohibited from using its purchasing power to negotiate prices. It would pay whatever the companies or private middlemen charged. No questions asked. To appreciate how extraordinary that provision was, you should know that Medicare does negotiate doctor's fees and hospital payments. But doing the same with drug prices was ruled off the table. You should also know that other government agencies, such as the Department of Defense and the Veterans Affairs System, do bargain for drug prices and get some of the lowest prices in the country. But Medicare which was about to become the biggest purchaser of all, was forbidden from using that purchasing power. The person most responsible for pushing this peculiar bill through Congress was Representative Billy Towson, chairman of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Shortly after its passage, he retired from Congress and was rewarded by being named CEO of Pharma, the trade association, of the pharmaceutical industry at a salary of $2 million a year. When Barack Obama was running for president, he expressed outrage over this deal 
and promised to try to overturn the provision that prevented Medicare from negotiating drug prices. But now look what's happened. All talk of overturning that provision stopped. And recently, it was revealed that the president and his new friend, Billy Towson, had reached a deal of their own. In return for leaving that provision unchanged, and continuing the ban on Americans buying drugs in Canada, the pharmaceutical industry would support Obama's health reform proposals and contribute, 100 and, or, and contribute $80 billion over 10 years, most of which would be in the form of discounts on brand name drugs in the Medicare program. Now that amounts to $8 billion a year in discounts, which to the industry is small change, and which would probably be offset by the increase in brand name sales over generics that it would stimulate. I think the administration sold itself cheaply. But this deal explains why the pharmaceutical industry is now blanketing the airwaves with ads in support of health reform, the new Harry and Louise ads, and once more illustrates its enormous political clout in Washington. I told you I would conclude by returning to the notion of corporate responsibility, social responsibility in the pharmaceutical industry. As I hope I've made clear, I believe that warm and fuzzy concept is at odds with the industry's fiduciary responsibility to maximize profits and certainly at odds with its actual behavior. I hope I've also made it clear that I believe prescription drugs are too important to be left to an unbridled free market. The industry itself talks the rhetoric of the free market while being utterly dependent on the government for its R&D, monopoly rights, and huge tax breaks. At the same time, it insists on complete freedom to pr produce any drugs it chooses, no matter how irresponsible. For example, one more erectile dysfunction drug instead of a treatment for malaria, and to price them as high as they choose. What is absolutely clear to me is that any regulation will have to come from the outside. If we wait for the voluntary exercise of corporate social responsibility, we'll wait a very, very long time. Thank you. Please join me now in welcoming our next speaker, Dr. Mary Ruhr. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to the Janus Forum. I love this exchange of ideas. I think it's a great way to really stimulate our thinking, and I hope to do that for you today. Um, as we know, the topic here corporate social responsibility is about the question to whom should the corporate pharmaceutical firms be accountable, the stockholders or society? And I have a little bit different take than my esteemed colleague here. I think both of these must be served appropriately or we have nothing. For example, if the companies do not please society, if they do not produce products that society wants, no one buys them, there are no profits, the company folds. On the other hand, without stockholders, without investment, there are no products. There's nothing for society to buy. There's nothing for society to be pleased about. So somehow, both of these have to be in operation and both have to be in balance. Where does that balance come from? I'm going to suggest to you today that the balance comes as much as possible from an open and competitive market. For example, let's take this issue of education of doctors. I think you can't, um, certainly you can't think that a drug rep is going to come in and not be excited about their product when they talk to doctors. Almost everyone in sales is excited about their product. If they weren't, they couldn't sell it well. So they're going to talk to doctors about all the pros and cons as they see it. And it's probably going to be a little optimistic because obviously that's why they're selling it. But the nice thing about competition is that the next drug rep that comes in is going to not only tell the doctors about how wonderful their particular product is, but how it's better than their competitors. And so in that way, 
there's a much more informed view. Now, as we're going to see in my talk, we do not have an unbridled free market in the pharmaceutical industry. In fact, it's one of the most highly regulated, if not the most highly regulated in the country. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that the competitiveness of this market has truly been compromised by regulations that were put in place in 1962 regarding the FDA. Of course, they were put in with the best of intentions, but they had unintended consequences that have truly pushed the pharmaceutical industry into a position where it appears to favor stockholders more than society. And hopefully, I'll address some of the earlier speakers' concerns and show how these regulations actually produce them. Now, on the next slide, we're going to be talking about these. They're called the 1962 Kefauver-Harris Amendments to the Food and Drug Act. And the first thing that they changed is the FDA, some FDA official had to actually sign off for drug approval. Prior to these regulations, Drug companies would send in their new drug application, and if the FDA didn't have an objection, they could market it within a certain period of time. After these regulations were passed, somebody at the FDA had to sign their name to the approval. Now, you can imagine, if you're an FDA examiner, you know that every single drug has side effects. There, there is no such thing as a drug without them. So you know that at some point, Somebody's going to have a side effect, it's going to get into the news, and Congress is going to call you down to find out why you approved that drug. So your job is on the line. So of course what you do is you ask the pharmaceutical company to do as many studies as you can think of so that when you get called by Congress, you can say, hey, I did due diligence, I had the company do all these studies. So that was a big change in the way it operated, and you'll see what the impact was of that shortly. Also, the FDA set standards for efficacy or effectiveness. Prior to the passage of these regulations, what drug companies would do is they would do animal testing with their product and then they would give it to select doctors and say, please test this in your patients with this disease and let us know if it works or not. And if it did, they would go to the FDA with their safety data and say it is safe for its intended use, which was the standard at that time. But after these regulations, the FDA set very high standards for efficacy. Now in a way, that might be good. You want to buy a drug that's effective. On the other hand, as courts found in the early 1900s, efficacy is a matter of opinion. Why? How well does a drug have to work before it's effective? Does it have to cure 90% of the people who get it? 50%? 10%? 1%? I mean, it might be worth putting on the market if that 1% actually it was a, made the difference between their life and death. How do you make that decision? It's a very difficult one. And so what is effective is not so easy to determine. Uh, the FDA also had oversight on advertising and labeling. All those drug ads you see on TV are first approved by the FDA. And the FDA uh, even has gone into looking at how, what food claims are. May 5th of this year, the FDA claimed that Cheerios, that cereal you eat for breakfast, is now a drug. Because of their claim on the box that diets rich in whole grains can reduce the risk of heart disease and lower cholesterol. They claimed it because that was on the box. Cheerios was a drug, and they threatened action against a cereal manufacturer if it didn't go through the process I'm going to describe in a few minutes. So this advertising and labeling oversight is, is quite intrusive. Uh, the FDA also uh, gave guidance to the companies for what they had to do before they could put their drugs in humans, which animal studies they had to do. And of course, again, given the concerns that an FDA examiner might have, they required many, many animal studies. And this increased every year. You can kind of see this as open-ended. These were not all uh, put into place immediately, but have been put into place over the last 30 years and continue to grow, as I'll show in a minute. And, of course, approval of manu manufacturing sites was another big part of this. In fact, the first one to be implemented. Within the first year or two after the passage of these amendments, the FDA shut down, shut down 50 percent, 5 of the pharmaceutical companies not because they were necessarily unsafe or unclean, but because they didn't have the required paperwork controls in place. Now, when you shut down 50% of an industry, you create what's known as a cartel or a partial monopoly. And this process of 
cartelization or creating a monopoly in the pharmaceutical industry has continued. And that has made the big firms bigger and put the small ones out of business, something I think that we all agree is not a good idea. Now, if you look at all these things and imagine a pharmaceutical company starting to implement them, you might think to yourself, this is going to cost them a lot of money. And you'd be right. On this slide, we see the median year of approval of new chemical entities, which were also called new molecular entities, I think, in the earlier talk. And these are new drugs, ones that have not been on the market before. On this axis, you see the research and development that went into these in 2003 dollars. <clears throat> Now notice before the amendments were passed, the R&D needed to bring a new drug to market did increase. But notice that the slope was much lower than it is after the amendments. If we take it out to today, we see if the pre-amendment trends had continued, it'd be about here. Now, after the amendments were passed, the, the amount of research and development increased greatly. In fact, there's a new point that isn't on this graph that's about here, this trend has continued. In other words, R&D increases every year the amount that's needed to get a new drug on the market. These numbers, incidentally, include failed drugs, because obviously you may start trying to do a particular type of drug and find out that it has side effects and then have to go to the second generation one. So <clears throat> it does include the failures as well, which of course it has to in order to make sense. Now, why do we care how much drug manufacturers spend getting a product to market? Well, we care because there is a direct correlation between what we pay in the pharmacy and what the manufacturers pay in research and development. And so we care about this because we care about the prices that we see at the pharmacy. Now, based on this information, we can predict what our pharmaceutical prices would be today had pre-amendment trends continued. And if they had, we would have get, had prices about 15% of what we have today. And you know, we might, we might be willing to pay that if we had more effective drugs. We might be willing to pay that if our drugs were safer. So we're paying 700% more than we have to, or we had to, pre-amendment. But what was thought would happen is what we would find is that our drugs would be more effective. In fact, when studies were done, it was seen that pre-amendment drugs on the whole, were quite effective. Only about 10% of them were not working for the indications that they were being marketed for. And so we're paying 700% increase to save 10%. Economically, at least from that standpoint of waste, it wasn't a good trade-off. But maybe it was from safety. We need to think about that concept because safety is very important. Now, to evaluate that, I want to show you what happened to drug development times after the amendments were passed. Here are the number of years it takes to get a drug developed. And by developed, what I mean is once the manufacturer says, hey, it looks like this drug could cure a disease, let's get it to market, the time between that decision and the time between the FDA approval is what we're talking about. And here you see various uh, time periods. The light blue ones are the pre-amendment time periods. As you can see, pre-amendment, it took about four and a half to five years for a drug to go from the lab bench to the marketplace. Now notice what happened in these red bars after the amendments passed. The time increased until it got close to 15 years. We don't have the point out here yet, but every indication is it's going to be higher. Now, what did this do for safety considerations? Well, let me talk about some real-life examples. I was working on an AIDS project. We were trying to find drugs that would help the AIDS population very early in the AIDS epidemic. And what we found was by the time the FDA gave us permission to put our drugs in people to test them, every AIDS patient in the country who wanted them had already had them. How did that happen? They hired black market chemists to make these drugs and distributed them throughout the AIDS community. And I must say, they did a pretty good job in terms of safety. Now, the FDA knew this was going on. It was against the law. The pharmaceutical companies knew it was going on and that it infringed on their patent rights. Neither did anything about it. 
which was probably a good decision. But some people can't wait the extra 10 years of development time that the amendments cost. They will literally die waiting, and many choose not to. Recently, cancer patients sued the FDA. They wanted to be able to buy drugs that had gone through the safety testing in humans, what we call phase one, the initial safety testing, but hadn't gone through the effectiveness testing because they couldn't wait either. The courts ruled that they had no constitutional right to do so. They appealed to the Supreme Court, which refused to hear the case. So as it stands now, if you're a terminal patient and you know that a drug company is working on a potential cure, you cannot buy it from the pharmaceutical firms. And since this lecture is about social responsibility and ethics, I think that those two cases are very interesting ones for consideration. Development times are quite literally a matter of life and death. And in fact, we can calculate how many people have died waiting for new drugs since the amendments passed. And the reason that we can do that is because we know how many of our new chemical entities were approved in the different decades. We know how long it took to develop them. We know the delay due to developments. And so we can calculate lives lost at 4.7 million. That's a lot of lives. And however, it could be that maybe, maybe these amendments did save lives that would have otherwise been lost. Well, if you look at the safety data from 1950 to 1962, what you can see is that there were four major drug problems that created about 1,500 serious safety events for a total of 1,200 per decade. Over 40 years, you might expect about 4,800 deaths if these, if these trends continued. Uh, and of course, since we have a bigger population, maybe closer to 7,000. So this is what we would have expected if our casualty rates were the same. But you know, even if we had had the amendments during this time period, researchers say that probably these problems would not have been addressed. Why? because most safety problems that we see are not predicted by animal studies. If they were, we would have caught them and not put the drugs on the market. A lot of them are simply only show up when we have large populations of people with genetic differences taking them. Now, even if this number is off by a factor of 100, imagine that this number is off by a factor of 100 and that maybe the amendments could have taken care of all these, every single one of them, and maybe this is a low estimate, so maybe the amendments could have saved as much as 700,000 lives. It's still considerably less than the 4.7 million that died waiting for life-saving drugs. So that's, that's kind of a scary statistic. And, you know, my, my colleague made a very good point about innovation earlier. Let's see what happened to that. Well, if you look at the number of new molecular entities or new chemical entities, the new drugs per decade, what you see is that prior to the amendments, we were getting about 300 new drugs per decade. Look at the plunge after the amendments. And it hadn't even come back by the 90s. Uh, in fact, people were estimating when they saw this plunge that we had lost about 50% of our innovations. And of course, since these weren't due to problems with effectiveness, remember only about 10% of the pre-amendment drugs weren't effective. You know, we were losing true innovations. Let me give you an example of, of how this comes down. I had the FDA actually call me up one day, the FDA examiner for my section. And they said, Dr. Ruer, I understand that you just filed a patent for prostaglandins and liver disease. And we can't tell you how excited we are about this because there is nothing for that, nothing. So we're going to help you as much as we can. This is an extremely unusual call to get from the FDA. <laughs> it doesn't normally happen. But I was fortunate to get one. But what we found out is that by the time we jumped through all the FDA hoops, by the time we had to do placebo-controlled trials, and incidentally, that's an FDA requirement. It's not what the pharmaceutical company sets up. We've been arguing that for years. So, so the, the placebo-controlled trial would, in liver disease would take years because liver disease takes years to happen and, and be created. The fibrosis or scarring in the liver takes years. It might have taken livers to show regression. Nobody had ever done it before. So we didn't know exactly what we needed to look for in terms of maybe doing a liver biopsy or doing some kind of blood 
work? What, what should we do? And if we didn't guess right on all these parameters, including the dose of drug the first time, our statistical significance would not be what the FDA required. We'd have to start over. And if we had to start all over, we no longer would have patent protection on that drug. It would go generic as soon as it was on the market, and we would not be able to recover, recover our development costs. Now, prior to the amendments, this wouldn't have been as much of a problem. The costs would have been lower, and so we wouldn't have to recover as much in a short period of time. You see, if you have 15 years of development time on average, and you have a 17 or 18 or 19 year patent, you can kind of see what happens. You have to get your profits in a narrow window. Now, Luckily, the patent office is slow, too, so you don't get your patents till later. You usually have a little more than three years. But you can see why drugs have to be expensive. You've got to recover your costs in a very short time. And because of these regulations, you also have to recover more costs. So it gets very difficult. And one of the things, too, I'd like to talk about at this point is the interaction between academia and industry. It's a good one. We pass things back and forth. I was talking about prostaglandins. The Upjohn Company gave many, many samples to academics, and they were free, and a lot of information was put out there, and the exchange was great. The academics got hundreds of dollars worth of free compounds. They've got publications. We got knowledge about the drug. It's a good thing. Now, also, I'd like to talk about a little bit, you know, the, the earlier speaker talked about where the drugs come from, I would say that there's hardly any drug that doesn't have some interaction with academia and industry, which I think is a good thing. But if you look at the list of the top 100 drugs that the VA and the Department of Defense use, you'll only see that about 6% of them give royalties back to academic institutions. And that's because, for the most part, it's basic research that's happening at the academic institutions, and the patenting and development is happening in industry. In fact, due to these regulations, pharmaceutical firms have really been turned into development houses, which I think is unfortunate, because we used to be much more into basic research. Now, the cost of all this in, in health care is actually quite astonishing, because when you lose innovation, and even today, about 50% of the drugs in development that go into the clinic are simply abandoned for economic reasons, which is another way of saying the manufacturer doesn't think they can make up their costs. And when you figure out that every drug spent on, every dollar spent on drugs saves about two dollars in hospitalization, you realize that every dollar spent in drugs is a good thing, not a bad thing, even at these higher prices, which actually surprised me. In fact, uh, more recent studies say that the number's closer to six dollars. So you can actually calculate and I know time is short, so I'm going to go kind of fast, how much money, and this is a range here, uh, that we lose when we lose these innovations and how many lives are lost. I'd like you to note that as many as 16 million lives may be lost because we don't have the innovation that we would have otherwise had. And if you look at the costs and money and compare them to actual health care costs, it's a double-digit percentage depending on what assumptions you make about, about um, whether these lost drugs, lost innovations, would be effective or not. About one out of five people who have died since these amendments were passed have been affected by them. That means somebody in your family probably died prematurely because of the impact that these had. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about some sa other safety compromisation. <laughs> it's going to have to be fast because I'm a little short on time. But it favors new drugs rather than old ones for new indications. If you see that your drug now has a new indication, you have two choices. You can do a lot more FDA studies on that drug and then watch it go generic by the time you get them done, or you can start over and have some time to recoup your investment. And so mo most people do that. That's a safety concern because we know what the problems are with the old drugs. We don't know what the new ones. They may be substantially worse. And delays in using old drugs for new indication. Bayer went to the FDA right after these amendments were passed wanting to do um, um, a calendar pack with aspirin to treat heart patients. And when they found out what they'd have to do and realized that, of course, their drug was off patent, they couldn't recover the cost, they didn't. So we waited another 20 years to find out about aspirin's good effects. 
It favors new drugs rather than nutritionals. The Upjohn company was developing some Lazaroids, named after Lazarus, rising from the dead, because they were thought to be so potent. I had a gentleman on a plane ask me for some. When I checked with the project team manager, he said, we can't give him any. It's not in the right stage of development, but just tell him to take a lot of vitamin E. It does the same thing. So why are we developing a drug when vitamin E would work? It's the Cheerios story all over again. Even though Upjohn was one of the biggest manufacturers of vitamin E, they couldn't make a therapeutic claim for it. The FDA would have told us that we weren't allowed to do that. And because it's not patentable, we couldn't go ahead and do it and recover our costs. Now, I want to talk a little bit about patents. We didn't used to need them in the pharmaceutical industry. I joined the industry in the mid-70s. At that time, they were still choosing to develop drugs without patents. But the decision was made shortly after I came that that would no longer be true because there was no way under the new regulations to recover your costs without patents. And so this has taken a whole level of prevention away from us. In fact, I could go on about this, but I think given time is short, if you want to ask me about folic acid and fish oil in the uh, question and answer, I have, some, I have some stories to tell you. So in summary here, the Hefoffer Harris amendments created a pharmaceutical cartel. And you know, monopolies are generally not considered a good thing, less competition, more problems, increase the riskiness of development of every drug that enters the development program. Uh, I mean, every 250 drugs that enter the development program, only one emerges approved by the FDA. It's a 0.4% success rate. And only 10 to 30% recover their costs, depending on which study you use. Because of this riskiness in the business, capital dem demands higher re profit returns. Now, they're not quite as high as the, as the uh, earlier speaker suggested. It's not that she's, she's giving you the right numbers, but the thing is the accounting, pro uh, accounting practices for high research and development industries, which the pharmaceutical is, industry pretty much is on top of, are different than regular manufacturing uh, sectors. So if you do it the same way, that profit's cut in half. However, it's still higher than other industries. And because this is a, a session on ethics, let's ask ourselves, who do we want to make the most profit in our country? Who do we want the investors to flock to? The toy manufacturers, the entertainment makers, or people who develop life-saving drugs? I know what my answer is. You might want to think about yours, too. Um, as I said, um, these, these regulations did increase the need for patents, increased drug prices dramatically, and decreased drugs to the third world, which because we are limited on time, uh, I invite you to ask me about in the Q&A. Pharmaceuticals, in spite of all of this bad news that I've told you about how difficult it is to get a drug through the process, are responsible for 40% of our increase in longevity, according to several different studies. And every extra dollar spent on newer drugs, drugs saves about $6 in other medical costs. In fact, the newer the drug, the higher the savings. And, of course, there's things like Alzheimer's patients getting an extra 30 months of independent living, which is, is a great thing. I don't know if it's actually that high. I haven't checked this particular study. But there are intangibles that come with quality of life when you have drugs that actually help you. So basically, when we look at corporate responsibility, social responsibility, I think we also need to look at the environment in which it works. When the FDA came down on Cheerios, and cherries, by the way, that was another one, I think it's a good indication that we are so highly regulated in this industry that it is extremely difficult to say that we have an unregulated market. In fact, I would say that most of the problems that the earlier speaker alluded to come from the regulations, especially the ones that hinder innovation and thereby favoring the Me Too drug process that was described earlier. Of course, with a 15-year window of development and many competitors going for the same class of drugs, you have to realize also that many Me Too drugs are runners-up. The company that gets there first gets all the 
all of the uh, great publicity and the runners up are called Me Too Drugs and they have to sell at a lower price in order to penetrate that market. However, they have great value. If you've ever had a family member that had to take a drug for hypertension, for example, you know that not all side effects are created equal. A drug may give good blood pressure lowering, but may have problems with side effects. But because of our genetic differences, that little tweak makes a big difference in side effects. So I hope that I've given you an alternative way to think about the concepts here. And I welcome your questions in the Q&A. Thank you. Great. Since we, bit, since we went a bit over time, we're going to go straight into the, the audience Q&A part. Um, as there will probably be a lot of questions, we ask that you keep your questions as short as possible and certainly no longer than 35 seconds. On the same note, we'll ask both our speakers to keep their answers as succinct as possible. One final note, each lecture we give out the hardball award to the person who asks the most challenging, interesting, and thoughtful question. So if you wish to be considered for the award, please state your name. However, beware if you ask a particularly easy or non-rigorous question, then the shameful softball award awaits you. So let's go ahead. Uh, this question is for Dr. Ruert. Um, all the statistics at the beginning of your lecture were based on these kind of crude extrapolations between the 50s and what things would have been like if those levels had uh, sustain themselves. And I just think that so much else has changed besides the FDA that that strikes me as kind of an illegitimate or sketchy move to extrapolate the statistics and just say, well, the FDA is entirely causally responsible for all the differences in uh, what would have been versus how things are. Well, you're right. I mean, in 25 minutes, I have to be pretty quick. But yes, there could be other factors. But the difference is so big. Um, I think that what is probably, um, I think one can say with a high degree of confidence that the FDA has definitely driven up prices and development times. Uh, there's no doubt that it's driven up development times. And the price goes along with that. Just because what pharmaceutical companies do is they know whoever's first to market is going to make the biggest profits. So what they do is they double up their studies, even risking you know, having to repeat them in order to make that deadline. So when you see 15 years, uh, that pretty much is due to the FDA. That is, that is the difference. Because that's from, you know, you saw it go up right so after the So it's not because things passed. are more complicated, like we're researching more complicated diseases now than we were in the 50s? Or uh, we're doing that, but we also have better techniques. Yeah, <laughs> you know? no, that's true. So we have a trade-off. So yeah, mm -hmm. so. yeah, so the 15 years is FDA-driven, definitely FDA-driven. Now the cost, of course, obviously, if we're repeating more studies in order to try to cram things in, uh, you know, that's going to be attributed to the FDA, too. Are, are the numbers perfect? No. I will be the first one to tell you that there aren't any sure numbers. But the differences are so big that what you have to recognize is that there is, um, you don't have to recognize it, but I invite you to do so. <laughs> There's definitely uh, a huge contribution there from the FDA. And again, because of the limitations of time, I can't share the details with you, but I'm very convinced that's it. I know when we were working, I used to say during my 19 years that we no longer were doing any research because we were so busy fulfilling the regulations. Great, thank you. Hi, um, this question is also directed to Dr. Ruart. Mm -hmm. um, you painted the picture that FDA regulation, new amendments to FDA regulations um, actually impeded scientific innovation. Mm -hmm. But I would argue that FDA actually doesn't do enough regulation work in terms of post-marketing surveillance. That is completely up to the pharmaceutical companies to, um, mark, to to make sure that the drugs are safe in the market after it's been approved by the FDA. The FDA also cannot, um, they don't have the power to approve an ad prior to its release. It can only evaluate the ad after it's been released to the public. Um, and also in 2002, the Congress passed um, the Prescription Drug User Fee Act. Mm -hmm. and Sorry, do you have a question? Specifically yeah. because we have short on time. Oh, no, I do. <laughs> I have a question. Um, and in, in that sense, I think that the pharmaceutical company and FDA has, they're, they're much cozier. Um, it, it seems that the FDA is serving the, 
the will, um, the <laughs> what the pharmaceutical companies want rather than patients or the general populace. Well, and there's some truth to that because think about it. A highly regulated industry finds it in its best self-interest to, uh, as, as, um, as my colleague said, lobby the regulators. And what usually happens in a highly regulated industry Regulators are co-opted by the industry to some extent. Now, the solution to that is not, in my mind, more regulation. It's less. I think the marketplace is more effective as a regulator. You know, but that's a whole other lecture. <laughs> so that's something to consider, though, because there is not an industry. If you look at Microsoft, it had almost no lobbying presence in Washington until it was sued for antitrust. Now its lobby is huge. I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to confront an industry with regulations, they're going to react. They're going to defend themselves by lobbying back. Now, I don't think this is a smart way to do business. That's why I think it's better to have marketplace regulation rather than government regulation, because time and time again, regulators get co-opted by the industry they regulate. In fact, if you look at, if you look at professional regulatory societies like pharmacists, what you see is it's the existing pharmacists, for example, that lobbied for regulations on pharmacists. Why? Because they would all be grandfathered in and now they could control who could enter the marketplace. And so they would be favored over the new entrants. There's a whole, um, there's a whole lore on this and if you want to send me an email, I will send you some references to look at that if that's a topic that interests you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, hey, I don't know. I don't think I'm eligible, but my name's uh, Gene Goldstein Plesser. Thank you guys both for coming. My question's for Dr. Angel. Um, a big point of your presentation was that uh, these healthcare companies have the wrong priorities. They're focusing on marketing and profits instead of uh, developing useful drugs that are really needed. So, what systems or incentives or regulations do you suggest for cr creating a system in which we could be developing these drugs for countries that don't have the money to support a for-profit industry um, or are rarer diseases, like what's the, incentive, what's the incentive to get companies to do this if it's not the market? I'll just make two comments. Uh, first, one regulation, it would have to come from the outside, as I said, and it could come from Congress via the FDA, would be to require companies to compare new drugs with existing drugs in the same class as a condition of approval. And the, uh, the, the new drug would have to be shown in some way to offer something that could be quite liberal, ease of administration, fewer side effects, uh, slightly better effectiveness. They might decide they want two of the same kind of, of drug on the market. It could be quite liberal. But you should have that information, that data, the new drug compared at equivalent doses with existing drugs as a condition of approval most Me Too drugs would not be approved. They couldn't meet that standard. That would force the drug companies to do what they claim they are already doing, which is turn their attention to discovering important drugs and not Me Too drugs. That's one thing. In terms of uh, trying to encourage the drug companies to invest uh, in uh, diseases uh, in other countries uh, that affect poor people who can't afford to buy uh, the drugs. Um, I think that it would be reasonable for the government to have certain requirements uh, along these lines of big industries that profit so handsomely from government subsidies and government granted monopolies. And I think that could be done too from the outside. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Angel. I have two questions for you. Well, two of the graphs I saw in your presentation really had me questioning what I was already thinking. One of them showed that the NIH was developing a lot of new drugs, and the other one broke down the costs of what uh, the pharma companies were doing with their profits. And I realized the graphs kind of answered each other. Because while you were purporting to show that the NIH... I, I didn't hear that sentence. Could you go back? I think that the graphs kind of provide the answer to each other. Uh -huh. Because when you're funding the NIH, when you're using taxpayer subsidies to research new drugs, mm -hmm. then why would pharmaceutical companies duplicate that expenditure when they can just take 
the new intellectual property from taxpayer subsidized research and just be the mass producers of it. And secondly, I wondered why the marketing and administration costs were so high and why so few of these were new NMEs. I was thinking maybe so few of them are new NMEs because this 15 year FDA regulation process is, encourages just repackaging old drugs and selling them. And why do we spend so much on marketing administration? Well, if you set up a yard with a ton of hoops that they have to jump through, can you really question why they're hiring expensive show dogs to do so? Great. Thank you. Uh, there are a, a certain number of premises in, in your question that I don't have time to go through. But uh, I would quarrel with this uh, FDA-imposed 15-year development timeline that's been presented. Um, I think a lot has been made about the Kefauver uh, Harris amendments. I've certainly never heard them talked about in that way as though they were the source of everything wrong with the pharmaceutical industry. The Kefauver Harris amendments did this one thing. They said that uh, drug companies had to show in clinical trials to get their drugs on the market that the drugs were reasonably effective. Before that, they had had to show, since 1938, that they were safe. But this was added in the wake of the thalidomide tragedy, that they had to also be shown to be effective in clinical trials. I think that's a good thing. I don't call that hoops. Uh, I don't think that you can say it's 15 years, but you could say maybe six years, 10 years, whatever. But it's a steady state. The FDA itself, when the drugs are presented to it for review, acts very quickly. Uh, almost every drug that's approved is approved within a year, and the innovative drugs are now approved within six months. So there's no hang up there. The FDA acts more like the industry's, I'm afraid, lap dog than the industry's watchdog. Dr. Ruart, would you like to give a quick response to that? Or? Yes, I would. I, I think maybe um, Dr. Angel and I should have a talk after this <laughs> session so that we can uh, be on the same page here because it's um, the FDA drives everything in development, and I mean everything. There's not one thing, in fact, oftentimes, because it's such a long development product uh, project, we have to go back and repeat studies or do different studies because the FDA changes their rules five years down the road. I mean, my first reaction when I came to Upjohn and sat on the project team was, how does any drug ever get out of here? And, you know, that's something you don't know unless you're an insider. I, I do not fault my colleague for not knowing that because it, it's, it's not something you know unless you've been through the process. But I think that the numbers are not just mine. They are from multiple studies. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Howard Shulman. I'm a general internist. Um, I actually live, uh, live this. Um, just a quick statement. It's very, it's very important to vote for people that are involved in, uh, you know, health care and uh, show an interest in the pharmaceutical industry and ask the politicians questions. It has to get to the answer about our companies responsible because they have to be regulated and have to, have to be good people there. So it's important to be involved and vote. Um, Dr. Angel, can you just tell me who are the people in Washington as far as U.S. reps and senators who are, um, I guess, the friends of sort of sunshine in, in um, sort of the pharmaceutical industry? And who are the people that are sort of the, the bad guys that are sort of, um, uh, you know, pulling the, the wagon for the pharmaceutical industry? That's really not a question that I, that I can answer. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry... I get the hardball. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just don't know the answer. <laughs> uh, because the industry spends so much money in, uh, in Washington and targets precisely the people who have the most power to give them what they want. So that until the uh, current administration, the lobbying money went 80% to Republicans, 20% uh, to Democrats. The great sucking sound you hear is the money shifting from the Republicans <laughs> to the Democrats. And they target particularly now the chairman of the important health reform committees like Baucus. So it shifts depending on what they want. And, and Do you think he's been affected by it? Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. You think they're just giving him money because they think he's a good-looking guy? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Angel, uh, 
in particular, you brought up a, a legislative provision regarding negotiating with the, uh, with the drug companies for the uh, Medicare prescription drug benefit. And w while I think at, at first blush that seems like, uh, like starkly ridiculous, when you look at the type of negotiating that takes place with hospitals and doctors, uh, it seems to me pretty evident that that is not negotiating uh, kind of just uh, let Jaws, hey, we've got a lot of people, could we bring it down a little? It's really basically regu almost regulating those, those entities as if, with regard to Medicare, they are public utilities. And Medicare basically says what the number is and Medicaid pays less. And what you have is a cost shifting to those of us who subsist on, on private insurance, whether through ourselves or our employer. So my concern is it's very easy to cast that stone, but that the existing negotiations really amount to, uh, in Medicare, really amount to price controls. They don't really amount to a market uh, negotiation. Well, they're not a market negotiation. Uh, Medicare is a huge payer. Uh, they use our money. And I think they have a right to say that, you know, that this is the sort of thing that we're offering. Uh, it's not uh, imposition. It's not, uh, this is fiat, and we will only pay you this much, in the sense that Medicare has no interest in driving people out of the medical profession or closing the drug companies. Uh, they really do listen to uh, what medical organizations say. But yes, it's a huge purchaser. And uh, insurance companies do the same kind of thing, but they're not nearly as big. Uh, any purchaser does that. Great, thanks. Uh, Dr. Ruart, could you explain to me how the Kefauver Harris Act decreases drugs to the third world? And also, do you feel that drug companies should have a social responsibility to create desperately needed drugs for developing countries, even if there isn't a market incentive? Well, actually, they do. That's the, that's the funny thing about it. You know, the, the big killers in, in the developing world right now are AIDS. And, of course, the Kefauver Harris Amendments, by making, for example, in the, in the AIDS uh, example, make those so expensive that even when pharmaceutical companies reduce the price, and they have in some, in some cases, the amount of money that's still needed to pay is often above the income, the annual income of the people in those countries still. And in some cases where the drugs have been given, they have ended up in Europe sold for more money so that whoever handled the drugs can profit. In addition, most third world countries tax heavily uh, medicines, um, maybe up to a third to a half. So that's another problem. Um, and, and to take my liver example that I talked about earlier, one of the things we were considering developing it for was schistosomiasis, which is a parasite in the third world. It, it, we, we had evidence that it would work there. But unless we could get it on the market in the US, it wasn't going to get to the third world. So what the Kefauver Harris Amendments do by limiting innovation in the US, they limit our ability to ship it overseas. Now, do I think that companies have a social responsibility to give it to the third world? I would say I don't think they have that responsibility, but I think many of them are doing something along those lines. Partly because I think, as, as uh, Dr. Angel said, it's, it's a good marketing thing. It shows social responsibility. And partly because some of the people that are involved in that think that that's a very good thing to do. But there are many hurdles to doing that. And the biggest hurdle of all is getting the product developed in the, third, in the, in the first world so it can be given to the third world. Dr. Angel, would you like to add to that or not? Uh, no. OK, great. Thank you. Hi, my question is for Dr. Angel. Um, in regards to the solution to the massively high profits and issues that we're seeing with the current uh, drug developments in the pharmaceutical industry, <coughs> You had a relatively vague statement that needs some sort of outside regulation. Um, due to the fact that we've seen current regulation and bargaining between the government and the pharmaceutical industry has been completely subverted by the pharmaceutical industry because of the mass amount of money they have, how do you propose that any outside regulation is imposed upon them? How, how would you propose that, other than something vague involving the FDA and Congress, and the second part of that question is, do you believe, how, how is that better than the freedom um, that we would have if we had a free market in drug development? 
Thank you. Let me take that last question first. Um, I can't imagine an area where a totally free market and caveat emptor would be a worse way to go. Uh, here's a bunch of pills. Uh, you have pneumonia. You know, Joe Blow down the street made these pills. Try this pill. Oops, you died. I guess that one didn't work. <laughs> I guess I guess the market spoke. So. And, and along the same lines, a, a lot of what I believe Dr. Ruhr was implying um, was that somehow it was burdensome uh, to require that drug companies test their drugs in randomized controlled clinical trials. Randomized controlled clinical trials are a great invention of the mid-20th century, a, a huge advance in medicine. Before that, it was all a matter of testimonials and anecdotes, and you had leeches and, and bleeding. Uh, and if somebody said, well, I tried this and it worked, uh, people believe that. Uh, you have to have rigorous scientific studies to know whether the outcome you're looking for is really a result of that drug or of something else. So anything that suggests that we can somehow get by with guessing or speculation, uh, I think, uh, is a step backwards towards the 19th century. Um, also, a lot was made of somehow, in waiting for these clinical trials, people are dropping like flies. Um, there, is, there is no way to short circuit the, the, uh, the regular advance of scientific information. You certainly can't do it just by guessing. And the assertion, uh, the implication is that, that drugs are either good or they're not good. But drugs can be bad, too. And if you use untested drugs, probably a lot more often they will harm you than help you. So it's, it's speculative to say that there are wonderful drugs out there, but there aren't harmful drugs out there. They're both. And so you have to do the scientific studies to work out what's effective, what's not effective, what's safe, what's unsafe. Um, now, what was the beginning of your question? Um, the the outside regulation oh, yes, that yes, yes. beyond uh, something that's, that's, a, that's a good question, because it, it's um, very difficult now. Uh, we do have, I'm afraid, a government of special interest to a remarkable extent. Uh, the uh, Congress is bought and paid for, and the FDA uh, is, can only do uh, what its enabling legislation allows it to do. So the answer is in Congress. Uh, and if voters are aware of this, I hope that they can exert some pressure toward uh, breaking the, the stranglehold of the pharmaceutical industry on uh, legislation affecting this. But then there's another place, and that's uh, the medical community. Doctors have got to stop living off the pharmaceutical industry. You know, a doctor doesn't have to buy any meal if he doesn't want to. A, a drug rep will buy it for him. Uh, that has got to stop. And that has got to come from the medical profession. Because one thing that doctors learn is a very drug-intensive style of medicine. They learn to believe, uh, and they believe it just as the public does, that for every ailment and discontent, there is a prescription drug. Uh, most studies that have tried to compare drugs with lifestyle changes, and there have been very few such studies, in diseases like uh, type 2 diabetes show that the lifestyle changes are for, far more effective. But we learn, we doctors learn, and patients learn too, that somehow drugs are great. Right. Um, just wrap it up. Okay. Just uh, and then the next thing, we learn to believe that good drugs are better than old, I mean that new drugs are better than old ones. And we learn to prescribe drugs for unapproved indications. This is the sort of distortion of the medical profession by this industry. Great. Dr. Ruhr, did you want to give a quick response to the first part? Yes. I am not against double blind studies, but I am against I, I I am against having people wait when they're dying and not have the option if they choose it. I think they should have the freedom to choose to take whatever drug that they feel is in their best interest. 
hopefully they're making that decision with their doctor. Um, and, and I would agree with my colleague that um, FDA and most everybody in Washington has been bought, including Congress, which is why more regulation isn't going to help. Uh, the pharmaceutical companies, uh, through their lobbying efforts, will probably make those laws, and the only way to take them to task and make them accountable is to go back to the marketplace. And, you know, I, I'm, we did better before the amendments. You know, we had a process that only gave us 10% ineffective drugs. I would venture to say that uh, my colleague believes, and I might actually support her in this, that there are more drugs on the market today than 10% that may not be effective. So we haven't really done better, but we have let people die waiting, and there are many of them out there. But there are other changes in the mm -hmm. smaller uh, tariffs. Yes, but that's the main one. Thank you. We'll take our last question. Hi, my question is for Dr. Rua. You, you talked about how um, the research, how the amendments have led to high drug prices because of research and development costs. But we heard from Dr. Angel that 31% of costs are in marketing administration. The profit margin for pharmaceutical industries is enormous. Um, how, do you, how do you respond to that? Well, actually, again, when you do the accounting the same way you do it for other industries to which the pharmaceutical industry is compared, the profit number is about half what was represented on those slides. Now, it, it is higher, though, than other industries. And I think, personally, that that is a good thing. And the reason I think it's a good thing is I want, personally, capital and investment to flow into an industry that's producing life-saving drugs as opposed to toy manufacturers or entertainment. And that's what's happening. But you know, when you have a highly regulated industry, strangely enough, that's exactly what happens. Profits are high. AT&T, when it was regulated, its profits were extremely high. That's why it was a choice of widows and orphans for their stock. So. Um, also, the marketing and administration, uh, the, the marketing information is out there. I think the net last numbers I saw were $59 billion for R&D and $15 billion for marketing. That's about 20, 25%, you know. So, you know, the number is a little misleading. Administration is high. Now, my colleague gave some good reasons that it's high, and, and, and she claims some of that is marketing and I guess we could we could talk about that and, and but but again the way to fix it is is not to look at in my opinion the percentages the way to fix that is to have more competition. This industry is not as competitive as it once was and the reason is it's been consolidated by these amendments. If we want competition I believe is a better regulator than Congress and the FDA because Congress and the FDA can be co opted by the industry. Thank you. And I agree with my colleague uh, that that is what has happened. We just, we agree what the symptoms of the disease are. We have a little bit different idea of what the, um, what the, di the diagnosis is and therefore what the therapy is. Dr. Angel, really quick response. Yeah, I don't think you can disagree about facts. You can disagree about some things, but not facts. And I was talking about the top 10 American drug companies. I looked at their annual reports and their SEC filings, and the figures I gave were exactly what the industry gave. Uh, it's 83 billion for marketing and administration, 41 billion for R&D, 49 billion, as I recall, for, um, for profits uh, after expenses. That was their figures, not mine. But Great. they separate out the marketing and the other ones, but we should talk about that. We, we need to be in alignment on our numbers. <laughs> Great, thank you. Now you're all invited to this small catered reception outside in the lobby. Thank you for coming out, and let's have one more hand for our speakers. Terrific. I think it's a terrific idea. I just found out about it today uh, that people from all over the campus with very different points of view come together uh, to bring two people to have a reasoned argument about those points of view and then they participate and they get awards for asking the best question and, and the worst question. I think it's wonderful because even though I am extremely critical of the free market for prescription drugs, I'm a great believer in the free market of ideas. I think no idea should be off the table. I really enjoyed being involved in the Janus Lectures. I had a colleague with me that I respected and disagreed with to some extent, but that was okay because I felt that 
Everybody is trying to make the world as good as possible. We just have different viewpoints on how to do that. Only one of us is probably right. We need to be talking so that we can get exactly the solution we need.